Hi, I'm Brett Kelly, curator of the National Civil War Museum. And I'm Mary Beth Kirkus, director of development. And this is another see, touch, and feel moment brought to you by Dixon ACR of Williamsport, Pennsylvania. So yeah, we're gonna kind of get into a little bit of a Halloween sort of feel since awesome. for the awesome. month of October. And um, you know, these are some of the artifacts from, from the museum's collection that sort of have a lot to do with the art of death and the culture around dying. The that, art of death. That sounds like it's very structured, something that you really had to be prepared for. You did, you did. And so, um, you know, in the early 1800s, there's a culture around death and dying um, in the um, antebellum agrarian south and also in the Victorian industrial north. There's um, a, a lot of people are questioning uh, death and dying. They, they want to know what happens to the spirit when it leaves the body. And, mm -hmm. um, and so in this kind of quest to make sure that uh, their loved ones who are really dying, people were dying at sort of a rapid um, pace. The, the um, life expectancy is quite low mm -hmm. um, in, in, the, uh, uh, in this time period. You know, children are, are dying 200 um, out of 1,000 children are dying every year. Right. Um, now, so, is, this, um, is this interest in, in dying and what comes after, this isn't necessarily a new thing. It's more, it's more of like a, an evolution of what's been going on since the Egyptians or probably even before that. Oh yeah, that I mean, we've, there's always been a fascination with death and dying mm -hmm. among humans and, and trying to figure out what happens to us, you know, when, when our bodies stop working. And, mm -hmm. and so this is sort of, um, it, it gets a little bit accelerated in this time period. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because of the rise of spiritualism. So um, in 1848, a lot of folks, uh, experts on this, and I'm not one, um, say that in 1848 is really kind of the birth of American spiritualism. Mm -hmm. You know, you've had um, folks like um, Mesmer who were, you know, hypnotizing people and literally mesmerizing them into mm -hmm. sort of spiritual trans, uh, uh, spiritual um, communing. Mm -hmm. But in 1848, the Fox sisters show up on the scene. And these are two young girls, they're 11 and 14, and they say they can commune with spirits. And so they, through a lot of knocks and whistles and, and coded language, they build rather lucrative career around speaking to the dead. Really, at that young an age? At that, it yes. It sort of sounds like it's kind of veering towards a Salem witch trial kind of vibe to it. <laughs> well, we're past that Puritan time period. Mm -hmm. So people who want to know what happened to their loved ones feed this trend. Mm -hmm. So Horace Greeley lost seven children. Mm -hmm. And being in the publishing business, um, he wanted to commune with his children and know that they had passed on to a safe, you know, to, to a better place. Mm -hmm. And so he sought the Fox sisters out to try to, to um, commune with his lost children. Is that how they kind of gained fame? Oh yes, uh -oh. yes. Um, <laughs> Horace Greeley helped to amplify that. But remember too, in America, we're in the age of Edgar Allan Poe. You know, we've mm. got him tell, doing serial stories about the telltale heart and right, you know, right. all of these, uh, and his you know, very famous poem, um, Annabelle Lee. All of this comes in the pre-war era. And so what happens to the people who live in this time period is, there's a real culture around death. Mm -hmm. So what you're striving for is you want to, um, you want to die a good death. Mm -hmm. And so a good death is you die old, in your own bed, mm -hmm. surrounded by the people that you love, and you're able to grant forgiveness for past harms, and you're able to impart wisdom onto the next generation, mm -hmm. and then you pass quietly into the night. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the women, take over because um, all of this culture around death is really driven by the women of society. There are specific rules about death and dying, and there are certain fears that are waylaid by the practices that they perform. So when you die in your bed, upon the moment of your death, the women go out and they stop all the clocks in the house. And then they go and cover every reflective sur surface in the house. So. Um, we can't, you can't see the spirit in, when you pass a mirror or something like that. Now, why don't you want to see the spirit? You want them to be able to f freely move on. Oh, so it's afterwards, after the spirit has gone and established itself in the next 
realm or world or whatever, then you want to draw them back and talk to them. <laughs> yeah, then you want to, yeah. But so, so okay. part of it is, um, and we'll get, we'll get into that, kind of put, put a little post-it note on that, and we'll, okay. we'll get back to that. But um, in the Irish culture, you know, they opened the window at the time of death so the spirit could leave the house and it wasn't trapped. And so that's how you had a good death. And then at that point, then the mourning process starts. Now there's strict rules set out for how you mourn a loved one. Mm -hmm. So a sibling is mourned for six months. A, uh, a child is mourned for a year and a spouse is mourned for two years. You go through a process of two years. Wow. Two years. Um, you have full or heavy mourning. Mm -hmm. Then you go into, um, or you go into, you start with heavy mourning, then you go to full mourning, and then you go to half mourning. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you should clarify that those rules only apply to women. Now, they only apply to women. Um, why don't they apply to men? Well, because men have to get on with life. Ah, so I most see. men, most men would only mourn their spouse for about three months. Okay. So and, is this a uh, the amount of mourning you do, and is it is it a uh, social? Your does it depend on your standing uh, in society? How much you actually display this mourning process? I would say that up, the upper middle class and and the upper class had more time to mourn. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the working class. They didn't have time to spend on this. Now they would dress in mourning as best they could, mm -hmm. but you know it's really Queen Victoria who sets the precedent for how women of culture should be mourning their loved ones. And so they would wear uh, crepe silk or wool. Uh, they had special bonnets. They had what they called weeping veils that they would wear at full during full mourning. So the rule was you went out with your face covered. You it, and part of this there's part and parcel to it because. Part of it is you wore black because you didn't want you wanted to be less noticeable to death, mm. and then you wore these loud clothes because the crepe would rest, rustle when you walked. Mm. It was almost to ward off death, uh, to to okay. you know keep death away from you. Because I mean, who wants to have a, a husband and father die and then all of a sudden death comes and takes the mother too? Mm. You know, so now you've childless or you've got parentless children, and yeah. and so. All of it is, and all of it too, is sort of centers around this fe the fears that they have mm -hmm. from death. So, so did Queen Victoria have these fears? Oh, she was uh, she was plagued as was as was Mary Todd Lincoln. Mm -hmm. They were literally plagued by their fears of death, really? uh, which caused them and sort of drove them to to do the things that they did that became part of the culture around death. Mm -hmm. So one of the big fears was you didn't want to be buried alive. Mm -hmm. I so. See that. Yeah, so they built waiting houses for people, almost like the modern day funeral home or morgue, oh. where a body could be taken and then they were sure that the person was dead. Hmm. And that's that's also why you know you have a wake, because hmm. you stay up all night before the person's to be interred to be sure they're dead. Right. Because the so, last thing you wanted to do was bury somebody alive. So how long would they stay in one of these waiting houses until they were sure they were dead i would uh, yeah we don't I'm need to get into the gory just, details of like that. take a knife and poke them a few times and, you know well, you save could, a little bit of time there uh you <laughs> could do that but i mean honestly if you're in a deep coma you're not going to respond that's that's probably true so yeah. there was no way to track brain brain waves i mean you could listen for heartbeats or feel for a pulse but as we know in modern with modern science that in, in some deep comas there's still brain activity and yeah. people have been known to recover and Mm -hmm. um, I think you told me a story about a soldier who was... Yes, uh, in one of the letters we have in the collection, um, a soldier uh, died of illness, and uh, his father had come to uh, where the army was encamped to collect his son's remains, and uh, when they uh, dug the body up and opened the pine box, uh, his son had a very distorted uh, uh, look on his face and he also you know he had the, the fingernails that were pretty much torn out uh, uh, evidence was, he was trying to climb out of right, the box yeah. yeah and you know that was <clears throat> written by another soldier who you know probably heard that story mm -hmm. from somebody so you know you got to take it with a grain of salt but I'm sure that things like that happened especially in wartime mm -hmm. when you know so many soldiers were dying 
the surgeons were harried, they were so busy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, constantly. Uh, I could see where there might be a misdiagnosis every now and again. And when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of men in the ranks, every now and again adds up to a lot of people who might have been right. buried uh, prematurely. Well, and that feeds the fear of this culture is because, you know, because you're striving for the good death. Mm -hmm. When um, your loved ones are dying in the numbers that they're dying in during war, mm -hmm. in, in those traumatic circumstances, there's no way to be ensured that your loved one mm -hmm. had that good death process. And all of the things that you knew would let their spirit move, or you, you practiced, that would let their spirit move on to the, the next world, none of that was happening. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't surprise me that within a matter of days and weeks following a major battle, mm -hmm. not only were we having battlefield tours by, by residents of towns and cities to, 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 to morbid tourists that were coming to town, you were also having ghost tours and stories of spirits along the battlefield, in the mists of the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And so this, this whole um, era of, of ghost and, and um, you know, spirits being trapped and, and, and held within the areas of their, you know, their, these traumatic deaths mm -hmm. grows up out of all of this fear of, uh, and separation from what you know is the way to bury somebody. Right. So, so how did they, how did they cope with this? Um, not being able to uh, publicly mourn, to be able to um, have that as a, as a, release, uh, so to speak, um, it, it must have put a, a lot of pressure on people who really depended and leaned on their their uh, spirituality, mm -hmm. their religion. Um, you know, you got to wonder if that really uh, did it affect them in, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I would think that it would push a lot of people over the edge if they didn't have an outlet. Well, I would think, you know, I think we go back to Mary Todd Lincoln, and I think that she's a perfect example of being trapped in that mourning. You know, she lost two sons and lost her husband to a traumatic death. But even before she lost uh, President Lincoln to, to his assassination, her fear over losing her son Robert um, mm -hmm. kept him out of the action. You know, he was held back from pursuing his military career because she held such sway over her husband mm -hmm. and she feared so much losing her, her third and final son mm -hmm. um, that it really did, I mean, it affected her in the fact that she had migraines mm -hmm. and she sought out spiritualists. She had seances in the White House. She had, uh, and th this was happening everywhere. And right. so what people would do is in order to wait, kind of put that off mm -hmm. is you would make sure you had keepsakes Mm -hmm. from the people that you love before you parted with them. Right. And one of the most popular things to give one another were lots of hair. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And from that evolves a whole art form mm -hmm. around hair. So they actually created, this is, a, this is a piece that's in the collection, which I, we've talked mm -hmm. about before. Right. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a watch chain and it is made of human hair. Mm -hmm. um, it, this, the, the locks of hair were braided into these intricate patterns. They were worn as jewelry. So we talked a little bit earlier about the stages of mourning. So when you go in, when you come out of heavy mourning and you go into full mourning, where you lose the weeping veil um, and you're still dressed in black, mm -hmm. you can add white collars and cuffs to your, um, to your dresses and you can start to add jewelry in. But the rules to jewelry are they have to be, they have to be minimal, and they have to be in some way a memento of, of someone you loved. Mm -hmm. So crafting hair into a piece of jewelry was a way for you to accessorize your outfit, mm -hmm. still be somewhat stylish, right. but wear a memento of somebody you loved. Right. Another way to do that is with something like this. Um, I don't, you're closer to that, I'll let you yeah. um, hold it up for the camera. And that is, um, that's a memorial medallion. So you could attach mm -hmm. that to a pin mm -hmm. and wear it on your dress. You could right. wear it uh, as a brooch uh, mm -hmm. hanging as a pendant around your neck. Right. And on the back here, it has a uh, graveyard scene of someone mourning at his, uh, his headstone or mm -hmm. his, his monument there. So that's, that's a really interesting piece um, that uh, I would imagine uh, would become a, a family heirloom in every mm -hmm. every home. I imagine there must have been a lot of these right. uh, around 
at that time. Well, and so, and this is an interesting thing, going back to that art, the hair jewelry, this is a, this is a hair safe. So you would put this on your uh, vanity, on your dressing table, and you would collect the hair from your brushes and combs and keep it in this hair safe until you had enough that you could create something from that. And there were whole books with instructions on ways to make uh, brooches and, and uh, bracelets and earrings and things, mm -hmm. ear bobs out of so uh, pieces of hair. Clean out their combs, and mm -hmm. they didn't just wait until they were getting a haircut or something. No, nope, no. Nope. <laughs> well, with thing with something like this piece, you would need to um, you would actually have to cut a long length of hair. Mm -hmm. But for the smaller pieces of jewelry or pieces of jewelry, you could basically clean it out of a hairbrush. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a after the war, following the war, there was a, a wreath that was made with Jefferson Davis's hair as a lock, uh, a lock of Jefferson Davis's hair as the centerpiece of a wreath that was made of hair from all of the Confederate generals. It was on display. Really? Yes, and actually Verena Davis was presented a wreath of hair from the quote, patriotic women of the Confederacy. They all took pieces of their own hair and created this wreath for her. Um, I'm yet to find a photo of that. I, yeah. I can't find it anywhere online, huh. but they presented it to Verena Davis as a, as a gift of, the, uh, of their love and affection for the First Lady of the Confederacy. Wow, that really does go to show how much things have changed. <laughs> Could you imagine today being presented with a wreath of perfect stranger's hair <laughs> and the, the smile that you would have to create? Uh, oh, but this thank is... Thank you, this is lovely. <laughs> Set it over here. Yeah, but that was that was a sign of affection. If you presented yeah. somebody with a, with art from made from your hair, it was um, it, it was like the friendship bracelet of the nineteenth century. Right. It was, you know, it was something. It, it it was personal. It was meant for you. Now we when we go back to the spiritualism of of the um, this time period, this is a perfect piece to take with you to a medium or spiritualist if you want to commune with the, the uh, spirit of this particular individual. Why don't you go ahead and tell everybody what the story of that one is? Okay. Well, this uh, actually uh, came with a, uh, a note here, if I can pick it up without destroying it. Um, and this uh, was written, yeah, well, I'll just read it. It says, uh, my husband's purse uh, taken just as it is from his pocket, October 18th, 1864. Uh, and it uh, says that it belonged to Major General David Bell Burney. Uh, so that would have been a note written by his wife mm -hmm. as she collected this uh, from his pockets uh, when he died. Yeah, uh, so I don't know um, if, if his wife would have gone to see a medium or something like that, but this is something you would take with you because it was with him at the moment of his death and it was personal to him, that you would take it with you to the spiritualist in the hope that it would make that connection to the dead. Right. Um, same thing with a pocket watch similar to this, um, a piece of hair jewelry, something that was uh, a, a, a product uh, or was with this so personally um, attached to this individual. Mm -hmm. It, it um, increased the, the likelihood that you could make that spiritual connection. Right. Right. So, I mean, it's, um, it's we like could talk it's, about it's like it's charged or something yep, because of the, the monumentalness mm -hmm. of the of the moment of passing. Right. And, and okay. you know, the tragedy of war uh, changed a lot of this. Um, you start to see the phase out of the after the war or during and after the war, you see the phase out of all of these strict uh, rules about mourning. They're sort of loosened up a little bit. But the pursuit of um, spiritual connection and mediums and staying connected to those who have passed away, um, it's, that's still there. I mean, we see the growth of the, the community cemetery. So people mm -hmm. are no longer being buried in family plots. Now they're in national cemeteries mm -hmm. um, right. connected to battlefields, but they're also put out in the country where you can go out and you can have lunch with, with the, um, mm -hmm. your, lo your loved ones who have passed away. And, People would take picnics out there and they were designed as beautiful parks and many of them are still in existence today. It's a lot of, uh, oftentimes, you know, um, Dane will go out and do a, a piece at a, a tombstone and whatever, and that's, mm -hmm. it's inside one of these park right. cemeteries. Mm -hmm. um, but that's where all of this comes from. It's, it's staying connected to the dead 
And, and I think that, you know, we still hold a lot of those traditions very dear to us now. Mm -hmm. And um, they're still part of the American zeitgeist. And um, yeah, I think visiting a cemetery mm -hmm. and leaving flowers and stuff. I think probably the picnicking part of it has kind of fallen by the wayside. Mm -hmm. A little bit. A little. Well, in some cultures, it's still in some cultures, it's still very prominent. Mm -hmm. um, in in South American cultures, um, there is a lot of um, time that is spent um, on it, days of the dead, um, mm -hmm. spent with um, loved ones. So mm -hmm. it, it's not something that's it's passed out of the kind of the Euro American culture, mm -hmm. but I think it's still very prevalent in um, some of the immigrant cultures uh, to commune with with uh, those who have passed. And so I think it's. Um, I find all of this very fascinating, and I could spend an entire day talking to you about um, this connection to um, and how we celebrate and connect with with the spirits of those who have yeah. passed. But well, we don't have all day, so we got to wrap it up. We kind of do have to wrap it up, but um, but you know, it, the art and culture of death and dying um, is fascinating, um, and I I highly recommend um, if you're at all in interested in what we talked about today, going out and exploring some of these topics on your Absolutely. own. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and um, come and visit us at the museum and see some of these great things. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's another see, touch, and feel moment here at the National Civil War Museum, uh, sponsored by Dixon ACNR of Williamsport, Pennsylvania. We hope to see you again at the museum. See you at the museum. <laughs>